You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to Attention Matters with your host, Alice Aspen March. Alice is here to discuss why the kind of attention we get and give to others is vital and impacts our behavior and our feelings. People can remember forever the kind of attention they got from teachers, parents and grandparents, dentists, from everyone in their lives, especially when it feels good and or feels bad. Alice is here to give you tools to intervene in your attention factor. So please welcome the host of Attention Matters, Alice Aspen March. And we're live on Why Our Attention Matters, brought to you by Bold Brave Media. This is Alice Aspen March and her guest, Kentaro Toyama. I am so excited to have this particular person, man, professor, on my show today because I've been reading all about him this morning and I am blown away. Not only is he a professor at the University of Michigan in the School of Information, but he has testimonials that just go on and on about his work and him. And welcome to Why Our Attention Matters, Kentaro. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Alice. It's a great pleasure. It is a great pleasure. I have a question for you right out of the box. Your main thesis, which you call Digital Technologies Law of Amplification, is that technology amplifies underlying human forces. Can you tell us what that means and how it differs from common ideas about technology's impact on us? Absolutely. So most ideas about technology tend to focus on specific technologies and then suggest that those specific technologies are either good or bad overall. Um, Amplification says that it's much less about the specific technology itself and much more about the people who design them, who run them, or who use them. So technologies are, in the end, mostly just tools, um, and people use tools to accomplish the things that they would want independent of those tools. Um, So what that means is that in social contexts where things are already going well, if you add technology, things can get better. So, for example, you know, for people like you and me, um, those of us who have the the privilege of having a good education, who have jobs that we enjoy and so on, you know, if you give us technology, we'll find a way to uh, do those jobs better. Uh, Things will go in a better direction. But where things are failing, then even the best design technology can't turn things around. So, for example... You know, you can imagine in a, uh, let's say, a poor performing school, um, there's really nothing you can do with technology that's going to turn a a school around uh, if the administrators aren't on uh, task, if the teachers aren't well trained, if the parents of the children don't care about education and so on. So basically amplification is just to say that whatever the underlying human forces are, positive or negative or neutral, Um, You add technology, and it it improves things in uh, positive situations, it makes things worse in negative situations, and it might have relatively no effect at all if uh, the situation is either indifferent or dysfunctional or um, unable to achieve uh, its own goals. You know, that makes such common sense. I've never heard it expressed like you just did, but all I want to say is, of course. Yeah, I mean... I agree. Like I've heard, you know, some people will respond to and say, oh, that seems so obvious. And one thing that I always say is it's true that it's, you know, it's potentially very obvious. Um, but especially in our society today, uh, we have lots of opinions about technology out there that are basically saying that, you know, more innovation and more technology is almost always necessarily a good thing for society. 
And in my experience, uh, that doesn't that isn't borne out. You know, not only do I say, of course, but it's a very sophisticated viewpoint that sort of hovers above technology. Because, of course, if you don't have principals and teachers who are aware of what kids' needs are overall, technology is like a, it doesn't matter. If these kids need teachers' attention, which is how I look at things, and the, do they know that all kids have different needs for attention? Then, of course, technology will add to their life tremendously. But if they don't even know that much, it's like a throwaway. That's what you're saying, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I find, you know, when I speak to um, well-educated, often wealthy parents, you know, if you ask them, you know, what would you want to provide more for your children? You know, very few of them say, well, I'd like to get them even more up-to-date technology. Most of them would say, well, if there's anything my child needs, it's more adult supervision. It's more caring, knowledgeable adult supervision. Uh, in fact, I once tutored at uh, Lakeside School in Seattle. This is a very elite uh, private school. And um, it was amazing, though, you know, what I was being asked to tutor. You know, a lot of parents just paid me to sit there and watch and basically pay attention to their kids as they did their homework. Um, the kids often didn't even need, you know, any input from me, but they needed somebody there to watch over them because that attention translates into their focus and concentration. This is, you know, when people go into therapy, because they have a problem, and I think everybody should be born with a therapist, that means that somebody is listening to them and is there to answer their questions and to support them. And it's the same thing. A tutor, really, in certain instances, is the same thing as a, a therapist, because a therapist listens and kids need people who listen to them. And of course, if all their parents, if their parents and their older brothers, their siblings are on their iPhones, nobody's gonna to listen to these younger children. And I think that's what we're talking about. You have to look at the whole life of people. You just can't look at them using technology because if they're not getting what they need, technology really isn't gonna help much. Absolutely. Can I say that? I mean, I, yeah, I agree with you completely about this, you know, attention of other people. Um, in fact, you know, usually when people talk about learning and education, they focus so much on the information and knowledge transfer that they think that that's what education is about. But really, education is about the attending to of children as they learn things. Um, and, you know, that attention is what motivates motivates children and probably adults as well. Um, you know, ultimately, if you don't have somebody paying attention, kids give up on the task. You know, I see this with my own son now, which is that, you know, I'm not always sure that I'm providing the best guidance as a parent. But the one thing I do know for sure is that it's my attention that ultimately helps him and what he wants and what he's seeking when he's trying to understand how to do, you know, things and how to learn things. Um, and without that attention, you know, I might as well you know, leave him to play by himself in some corner of the world uh, w without the attention. It's there's, you know, there's nothing for him to understand what's good, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, what's correct, what's incorrect, you know, what things are creative, what's not correct, uh, creative. And all of that is ultimately up to human attention. And it's the one thing that computers can provide, that technology can provide. I mean, there's no such thing as a computer that pays attention to you in a way that registers to the child as, oh, somebody's listening to me. Well, our first, our primary core need is for attention, and everybody has different attention needs, but we don't know this in our society. I certainly didn't come from parents, and my father was a very famous ophthalmologist in Detroit, Michigan, and my mother had a college degree, and she was a teacher and a concert pianist. Nobody talked about this. Nobody said, for instance, what kind of a, it's your time right now, Alice, what kind of attention would you like from me? That is a prime question we should be asking everybody we're close to in our lives, I think. I think, that, yeah, I agree with you as far as that goes. I mean, there's a famous um, uh, Zen Buddhist story about, uh, you know, a um, Zen uh, student asking 
uh, his, it was probably his, his master, you know, what Zen Buddhism was all about. And um, the master apparently whacked him on the head as Zen masters are prone to do and said, attention. And the student said, what do you mean by attention? And he got whacked twice and said, attention, attention. <laughs> And uh, the student said, what do you mean, attention, attention? And so he got whacked three times, and the master said, attention, attention, attention. Basically, the message was that paying attention to what is happening right now, right here, is really ultimately what you know, life is all about. And uh, if you're not doing that, then you're missing something. You're basically on autopilot. Well, and I want to extend that explanation because when I had an epiphany over my head, because I was looking for the role I played in what I considered was my youngest son's uh, uh, self-destructive behavior because he had gone from heavy television viewing to using drugs, and I was terrified. So I was on a quest to find out what I had done or not done because my two older sons went straight through, but this kid didn't. He was 10 years younger and seven years younger. And I discovered that you can see attention. You can, attention has a attention is dimensional. We feel it, we can see it, we sense it, we remember it. And I don't think that that is a uh, a generally conceived definition. I don't think that people, and I don't know how I got it. I just got it really realize that their children feel their attention because energy is an I mean attention is an energy you feel right. what people where when people are listening to you for instance you feel heard absolutely I mean I would say you know I think most parents have experienced this you know there's that you know there's moments that happen almost daily in the life of a parent where you know the child says you're not paying attention to me. And they're right, right? Like you decided that you were going to sneak a peek at your smartphone or you were focusing on cooking or, you know, you got distracted by some work task and, you know, decide, drifted off while the child was right there. And uh, I think you're absolutely right. They can sense when you're paying attention when you're not. And um, at least, in, you know, in my conception of child rearing, paying the right kind of attention to your child is the most uh, valuable thing you can do as a parent. Oh, there's no doubt. And you have to determine, really, what kind of attention they want, because not all kids need or want the same kind. You know, some Absolutely. kids are, are auditory. They, wanna, they want a musical kind of attention. Some kids are kinesthetic. They want to go out and kick a ball. And some kids are, um, what's the other word I want? When you watch, the, you see things. They're visual. Uh, visual. It's very different, and I think that is the primary primary job of a parent is determine which kind of attention that kid watch uh, needs by not only watching but ask, asking him. Because if you if you really fill a kid up with what he needs, having a child is much easier on him and you too. Right, and I think that requires attention. The parents to pay attention, yes. uh, not just to the child, but to the to what it is that the child is, you know, seeking or responding well to. Right on. You know, one of one of the things we also want to talk about is parents seem increasingly aware that digital technology is not all good for their children. What are your thoughts on this, and what do you suggest to parents? I mean, we've talked, we've roughly skirted this. But if they're becoming aware, that we, we, we ought to acknowledge, you're absolutely right, you should be aware. And as I said to you before, when we were talking, one of my prior guests was a clinical psychologist. And, and uh, late adolescents and early adults are coming in for help with her. And I said, what are their symptoms? And these kids who spent their whole time on screens, which is not unusual, they don't know how to have a conversation, they're depressed, they're, they have sleep disorders, eating disorders, and this has to be attended to on their kids. I, the more we talk about this, I hope the parents are gonna get it. Kentaro, I have to go to, we have to go to a commercial. 
But this conversation is so electric for me. Let's let's talk more about this when we come back and we're live again. It'll be soon. Till then, stay with us. Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. WikiWags brings harmony back into your home for male dogs and their owners. Inventor and entrepreneur Linda Jangula has created the disposable doggy diaper wraps made with the male dog in mind. The built-in wicking ability prevents rashing and other potential health issues for your dog. Each wrap comes in four sizes and has dual reattachable magic tabs for easy adjustments. And each size has a 7-inch logo strip for adjustability. So they are comfortable and easy to use. No more fuss, just leave the mess to us. Whether you're in or out, your dog will be free to run about. Stop cleaning and start enjoying your home, and you can even leave your dog alone. To order your WikiWags, visit WikiWags.com. Or to find out where to buy WikiWags in your town, visit MyWikiWags.com and start enjoying having man's best friend around. And we're back, and we're really alive. And I've got a wonderful guest today, Kentaro Toyama. And we're really fired up about helping kids. That's just one part of the show. Helping kids get, well, helping parents first get in touch with the actual symptoms that their children are developing when they spend so t- so much time in, in in screen time and are role modeled by parents who are doing the same thing. The kids are watching their parents do this and the parents are watching their kids do this. And there's a huge gap. I wanna say that we ought to tell parents that when they're, that it, they're in their childhood, they are learning how to be self-sufficient, how to take care of themselves, to ask for help, to learn to discover what they are gifted in and they're not doing this as they're in front of the cell phone would you say that's true yeah i mean the i've thought a lot about how best to convey what digital technology is especially to parents and the best analogy that i can think of is that today's digital technology is a lot like a dinner buffet with respect to your child so let me explain what i mean by that So at a dinner buffet, you have lots of nutritious foods, right? But it's also mixed in with all kinds of sugary desserts and possibly even alcohol. So in short, it's a mix of good and bad things. Um, Now, in the same way that you wouldn't leave your, you know, four-year-old child at a dinner buffet by themselves to figure out what they should be eating, because you know what happens if they do that, Um, you shouldn't leave your four-year-old child with a screen letting them decide exactly what they're going to do and uh, sitting there for hours and hours on it. Um, On the other hand, I would also say that, you know, the occasional video or game is not going to harm the child any more than an occasional dessert. So, you know, the real question is how do parents strike a balance? Um, And... Uh, I think that depends on the parenting, it uh, depends on the style of parenting, it depends on the child, it depends on the age of the child. But the important thing to realize is that you have to pay attention in the same way that you pay attention to how your child eats and what they eat. Um, You know, the thing with digital technologies is that there are some things that I call cognitive candy. 
right? This, these are like video games, videos, things that are designed for the express purpose of grabbing and holding onto your attention while providing nothing of um, any significant educational or uh, other uh, educational value or otherwise. And those things are just like sweets, right? They're there just to tickle the palate, but to provide no meaningful re- uh, nutrition. And what that means is. Um, children that use screens in an unsupervised way just tend naturally over time to find those that cognitive candy and chase after it. And I think that has a number of downsides um, that uh, can't be overstated. One is that it basically you know, increases their tolerance for stimulation, which means that other meaningful activities that might not offer as much stimulation suddenly become really boring for them, and we certainly don't want that. Um, another thing is that it causes them to get into a cycle of kind of very quick gratification uh, without having to put in that much effort. So a video game is designed so that you know, you're just barely putting in some effort to get constant gratification, whether it's advancement in the game or you know, blingy noise effects, sound effects, and uh, graphics, and so on. Um, and again, that reduces a child's ability to sit and focus on tasks that might not provide that kind of gratification, such as doing your math homework or doing your writing assignments and so on. Um, and then finally, I would say that you know, most families have rules about when and where food can be consumed and what kind of food is allowed uh, and so on. And the parents should be just as careful about setting those kinds of rules for uh, children's consumption of digital media. I love the candy metaphor because if you eat too much candy, you get a lot of cavities. Which... Right, as well as poor nutrition. It also, you know, takes crowds out to whatever other nutritious foods you might eat. Um, you know, in and of itself, in small portions, it's not such a big deal. But if it becomes the only thing your child is getting, it's a major health problem. So uh, you said that so well and so clearly because I'm very visual. So I've got, you know, I got, I've, I've got a picture of this. But what about the parents who are really addicted and can't live without a constant telephone in their hand when they're, <laughs> you know, uh, it's just, it's. I was watching people on the air, airplane the other day when I came back from Texas. Immediately, the doors haven't even shut yet, and they're on the iPhones. Right. I mean, and by the way, children notice. Um, I have a good colleague here at the University of Michigan School of Information. Uh, her name is Sarita Schunebeck, and she has done studies of, you know, what children think about their parents' uh, digital habits. And, um, you know, the reality is they are just as... Uh, uh, critical of their parents' digital habits as vice versa. Um, And one of the things that comes out is, yes, if you as a parent are the one using your smartphone at the dinner table, well, in the same way that you wouldn't want to set bad, you know, eating habits for your child uh, by being a bad role model, you don't want to do the same thing with your uh, digital devices either. So you're comparing it to really eating, which is a wonderful metaphor, because that's taking, I once said uh, when I was working on television, these people are evil. They don't care what's going into the eyes and ears of our kids. And it's the same thing. Right. I don't call in fact, it. I would put it, I would say it's even worse than what you just described in that they do care, but what they want to do is is provide the most addictive stimulation in front of your children so that they'll continue to be customers or people who generate uh, ad revenue for them. Right. But I think that we got to talk to parents in facts because you are presenting some marvelous facts and I present pictures and maybe they need their left brains exercised or something more because <laughs> when you they do role model behavior like this but when the kids when the kids start this so early they're really not developing their inner resources that's what troubles right. me so much Absolutely. I mean, one thing that I will say is encouraging is I'm seeing more and more pockets of uh, parents who do care and who do understand the damage that digital devices can do. And they seem to be increasingly creating kind of parent um, groups and and movements that seem to be uh, moving the needle. Um, One that I happen to be aware of because I got a notice for this from my son's, um, you know, through my son's uh, uh, kind of parent group. Uh, there's a movement called Wait Until Eighth, which is basically a pledge that parents are supposed to take to um, delay giving their children mobile phones until at least eighth grade. I mean, if it were up to me, it would be twelfth grade. But um, 
But I think eighth is better than the current standard is. Uh, the latest research suggests that there are children as young as five getting their mobile phones, and oftentimes it looks like you know children who are seven or eight or nine or or ten are already getting a, a mobile phone. I just heard about this in in Texas, so it is moving around. Yeah, I, I'm pretty, uh, when I see an infant, oh, not an infant, they can't hold a phone, but a toddler with a phone and a game, my stomach gets upset because that's just, <laughs> right. well, it's the beginning of his addiction. Right. And, you know, one of the things about that is, you know, I think you're probably rare. Um, many parents, you know, love seeing their kids like swiping an iPad and so oh, on. Their I toddlers. Know. Because it gives them this belief that the kids are somehow smart. But the reality is using this, these technologies is not an indication of intelligence um, any more than it is to be driven around in a car, right? So, you know, one analogy that I try to provide for parents is that, you know, if, you're, if you believe that you want to help your child become an engineer or, a, you know, or a, a, a software engineer or somebody who writes computer programs and so on because it's a, you know, for, at least for now it's a good uh, job to have, um, use of the computer is not what's going to matter. It's ultimately their ability to do math, it's their ability to read and write. Um, you know, increasingly, you know, at least in some corners of the world, people think that the more a child uses a computer, the more computer literate they are. But in the same way that it actually doesn't take that much skill to use Facebook, that's not the defi defining thing in uh, being a software engineer. In fact, in order to get a job at Facebook, you have to be a lot more. You have to be able to do a lot more than use Facebook. You have to be able to, you know, write good reports. You have to be able to communicate well. You have to be able to uh, program computers. All of which are skills that require a lot more than just uh, using the tools that are available on a computer. And you also have to develop social skills, which these kids are evidently not developing. They don't want to have conversations. I've been I've been interviewed at a college at Rutgers here, and a lady was giving a big uh, uh, dinner conference, and she asked the head of the committee to call the caterer. And the head of the committee said, well, I don't know how. And she says, <laughs> a senior in college. I mean, it's true. It's true. Yeah, one one of the things that I'm finding, so, you know, I teach a class in which um, uh, we have 250 or so students, and they're all working on a team project but with a real-world client. And, uh, you know, some clients, generally clients are responsible, but sometimes clients are a little bit late to responding to email. And so uh, usually I tell, at the, you know, I tell the students at that point, well, you know, I suggest you just get on the phone and call them up. And, right. and in the last five or so years, I've discovered that students look at me like with this expression of shock, you know, like you're asking us to call somebody as if that is not something they have ever done in their lives. And for many of them, they haven't, right? All their communication is through texting and so on. Um, yeah, uh, one thing I believe is happening is that um, our younger generation is increasingly afraid of direct real-time communication because it doesn't allow them the capacity to edit, which is something that you can do when you're texting, right? So you can keep editing yourself until you're ready to send and be sure that what you're saying is exactly what you want to send, say and then send it, whereas in a real-time conversation like we're having right now, that capacity is gone. Um, and uh, some people are growing up afraid of that kind of direct real-time interaction. That is pitiful. It's, uh, I, uh, yeah, it's a little bit heartbreaking, I have to say. I, uh, yeah, and sad. You know, I read something this morning. If, if uh, you know, uh, education is to create minds and really not jobs. Knowing how to manage people is not a full full, well-rounded person because when they go home and they scream at their kids and they scream at their wife, but they can manage people, you know, a skill that they learn. I thought, isn't that an interesting way of putting it, that education is to make a mind and not a career? Isn't yeah, that I mean, I certainly subscribe to that philosophy of education. Um, but I think even if your goal is to educate somebody with uh, a career in mind, um, like you said, you know, all kinds, a range of soft skills are really important. And, um, you know, I do think that to the extent that the world is digital increasingly, that it's valuable to have these soft skills through digital channels as well. But you'll certainly be at a disadvantage if you, you know, among other people, if some, some people also have the ability to have uh, good personal skills in person or on the phone. Um, you'll be at a disadvantage if the only way you can, you know, communicate with others is through digital means.
You know, one of the things that the kids miss on the ear, on the phones also is gestures. You know, when I'm talking to you and we met, you saw my face. I might have used my Oh, my goodness, did that go fast? We have another commercial we're coming up to. But um, I'd like to ask you about your Geek Heresy Group, which rescues social change from the cult of technology. I love that. Geek Heresy. Would you talk to us about that when we come back? Because I think I we should to. all know about it. And you've got a book that I want to sell. Okay, we'll be back in. Stay with us, group. And I'm stuttering. I'm so excited. French Rastafarian baker Chef Oug Mat is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Chef Ouvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Ouvmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefoug.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality? But it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416 529 7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. We're at 866-451-1451 if you want to call and talk to Alice Aspen March and her guest, Kentaro Toyama. And I want, I want Kentaro to talk about the geek heresy that he, and he's written his book, and I put on Facebook today all about your book or to buy your book. I bought your book this morning. Go, Thank Kentaro. You so much. You're welcome. Okay, you're on. So geek heresy basically summarizes what I said about um, the law of amplification of technology, which is, again, that technology, for the most part, amplifies underlying human forces. Um, the important part about amplification is that technology doesn't add a positive uh, effect everywhere you take it, um, even though that's a belief that many people tend to have. So just to give you an example, um, you know, for – uh, society, I think I would say that in our public sphere these days, we are hearing more and more about the downsides of technology, and particularly since the 2016 uh, presidential election, when it seemed that uh, there was Russian meddling in our democracy. But until then, uh, most of us believed that Silicon Valley was a positive force for the world, and that all the technology that was coming out, so much of it free, uh, seemed to be adding a net positive benefit to everybody. Um, one of the more interesting facts about that is that um, over the last 40 or 50 years, uh, we in the United States have not really seen a dramatic uh, impact on the rate of poverty in this country. So if you look at the Census Bureau statistics, the rate of poverty in this country has been somewhere between 12 to 15 percent or so, and it hasn't gone up or down very much. Um, that same 40 or 50 period, uh, year period is exactly the same when we've had an explosion of digital technology. You could argue that it was a golden age of technology for the United States. Um, and not only were great technologies invented, but they have gone mainstream. So, um, you know, uh, Alice, you mentioned Detroit. Um, I live about an hour away from Detroit. And you can go to Detroit where a lot of people are uh, homeless or struggling to make ends meet. 
they all have smartphones, they all have uh, phone plans, um, and almost all of them use Facebook, but that doesn't mean that their lives are necessarily better in any significant way. Um, so, the, so if you believe that technology is necessarily a positive thing, you know, this kind of juxtaposition of these two facts suggests that um, you need to do something other than just provide good technology if you're interested in making progress against social problems like poverty. Uh, you know, Guy Kerasi basically gets into that in more detail for you know actual attempts to change things through digital technology and so on. Your overview in this direction is so vital. I think we've been missing it because everybody is so sold on technology that even even the, um, uh, California, I mean Silicon Valley now, is recognizing that maybe all that they have done is not very, not really benefiting humankind as much as they thought it would. And you know what really frightens me, and it isn't even here yet, is robot, are the AI <laughs> yes. and robots. I mean, yes. I saw, yeah, really. I mean, the the headlines I saw. People are going to lose their jobs. Massive amounts of people are going to lose their jobs. Well, that's, no, I we think that's any, true. And we I think, you know, even, I mean, basically, um, you know, anything that anybody is capable of doing at some point will potentially be automated. And at that point, it will become cheaper to hire a machine to do that job or to just have a machine do that job than to hire a person. And so, yes, I think the percentage of people who will be economically basically worthless as far as the current economy is economic system is concerned will just keep going up and up and up um, I think it raises a big question for our future assuming that the technological progress doesn't go away which is that you know how do you organize a society where large numbers of people um, don't have much that they can contribute economically and that includes you know people possibly like you and me there's no reason why my job might not one day be done by a machine Oh, I can't see that, because your your ability to bring all all these important issues to one place, I don't. Th well, I hope not. That's all I can say. I <laughs> well, hope not. well, of course, I'm not hoping for it either. But it might happen. There's nothing I you know that I'm thinking that couldn't, in theory, be done by machines. So we'll see. Uh, hopefully, yes, you and I will be long gone by then. But I still worry for our children. Right. And, you know, what I'm thinking is my work is more important than ever because my work affects all of us. And, you know, really knowing the bottom line that our bodies, like our receptacles for the kind of attention we need, and they, when we get it, we thrive, and when we don't get it, we don't thrive, we act out, um, that needs that needs to be really a general understood mythology, for a lack of a better word. You know, it works. Mm -hmm. uh, people need attention when they work, they play, they grow up, they're in partnership. And you know, when I first wanted to publish my book, they said, "Well, who's your niche?" I said, "Everybody." And they said, "It can't be everybody." I said, "It is." <clears throat> what? Oh, we have a caller. Okay. Hello, Alice. This is Eric J. Chambers. How are you, my friend? I'm fine, Eric. How wonderful of you to call us up. Speak to us. Well, I was looking for it online, and I couldn't find it, so I was like, well, I'll dial up and listen as much as I can over the phone. And it's working. Terrific. Thanks for joining us. Do you, yeah. do you have a question? Uh, well, I saw the book. No, no, I just wanted to listen. I saw the book that you had on, uh, in your hand on the picture, uh, Breaking, How to Break Up with Your Phone. So, so Thank um, you. I thought I'd, you know, give you a call. And, of course, you know, I have a daughter who, just like so many other teens, they love their phones. So just like the adults, too. Oh, yeah. And so One um, thing I will I say I is that, you know, the current, uh, I would say, range of uh, people who are, let's say, late teenagers and young adults, um, you know, so much of their social life is, uh, happens through their phone that I think it's difficult to ask them to, you know, put away their devices for good. But I do think there are strategies that they could use that help them take back their attention. Um, once again, the one, you know, most important thing to remember is that most companies that are involved 
uh, with a lot of digital technologies are hungry for your attention, and that's their business model, is to take your attention and sell it to advertisers who are the ones who pay them money. Um, and so if you realize that this insidious thing is going on, then hopefully you want to make sure that you're paying attention to the things you want to, not that they want to. And the best way that I can think of, you know, for most people to uh, – make sure that you know their phones aren't becoming their masters is to make sure that everything they do on their phone is uh, for a purpose that they themselves intentionally selected you know so that you don't end up going down rabbit holes of reading random blog uh, articles or watching youtube videos that you didn't intend to read or, or watch um, or so that you don't end up you know buying things that you didn't expect to buy before you started looking at your phone and so on and so forth so the most important thing is to really try to focus on what are your goals through the use of the phone and to make sure that you're goal focused when you're using your phone Absolutely. thank you that that's great isn't it eric and you can explain this to your daughter she'll understand she's graduating from high school soon that's right well and so, thank you, you know, so sometimes it can be a it can be a battle you know uh with the phone and uh but she's a good you know she's a good student she's still an a student for the most part but uh but sometimes uh not just with her but with others as well and even you know sometimes i have to make sure that I'm not overwhelmed by it. But I, um, but I do, like with most of my social postings, I do them through my phone way more than I do on the computer. And um, because I like using the emojis that the phone has, you know. <laughs> so, um, so that's why, I, you know, I like to just add a little bit more character into my, uh, my posts. And so Absolutely. the majority of it is through the phone and... Um, and so there's a number of ways that I use it as well, but I think the important thing is just trying to find that balance, yes, especially like right. uh, like when a kid has to have do your homework. Okay, put your phone down so you can do your homework. <laughs> and um, exactly. so sometimes I have to explain to her, look, do what you have to do, put the phone down, and, um, and then you'll have plenty of time to get back to it. But let's not neglect, the, you know, let's keep the main thing the main thing here. And I think the other thing that um, uh, teenagers and young adults have a challenge with with respect to social media is um, being clear that, you know, the people that you interact with through social media, the vast majority of them are not people who deeply care about you, unlike your your family and your closest friends, right? Most of us have many, Absolutely. many more acquaintances than we have people that really, really, you know, that we truly love and who who love us. And, uh, and one of the things that I think is very difficult for people who've grown up with a smartphone in their hands to understand is that that world of people who might like your posts or who might share your posts or might otherwise give you a little bits of approval is not – they're not people that really genuinely care about you. Their, you know, their approval is a tiny little uh, bit of effort that they had to do by clicking something, whereas the people that you do love and uh, care about and who love and care about you are really the people who can help you most understand what's valuable in life, what's not. Um, you know, even 100,000 people saying something uh, might not mean that much to the people that you care about the most. Such a, yep. a poignant point. You are so correct. Eric, thanks for calling. I really appreciate that. Uh, and okay, I'll... good hearing your voice. Nice, nice. Thank you. Kentaro, nice, uh, we are talking about, uh, and listen in, Eric, what uh, your points have been so good, Kentaro. Just the one you last made. Sit down with your child and explain that the 100,000 people really aren't as important in your life as your mom and dad. And if your mom, you know, the kids taught us to stop smoking. So we That's can right. give them that power to give to have us stop using digital everythings all the time. <laughs> That's right. Um, another, you know, kind of way to think about this idea that the people out there are not people that you want to take too seriously is, you know, um, you know how there's always stories of uh, young child, you know, performance, you know, performers like musicians and so on and celebrities who often when they grow up, they're a total mess. Yeah. Um, and I think that one reason for that, I think, is because they grew up in an environment in which you know, they couldn't help but believe that this million-person audience is what matters, 
when, you know, for most of us, that's just not, you know, that's not true. In the end, those people care a little bit about you, but not enough to really come to your help if you really need it. Um, the people, again, who care about you the most, usually your family and your closest friends, uh, those people's opinions of you will not depend on, you know, your ability to entertain them. Those people's opinions of you are based on, you know, how good a human being you are, how kind-hearted you are, how, you know, how much uh, effort and diligence you put into your own goals. And so for the same reason that, you know, I think the parents of, you know, parents of children, or, you know, of, ch of child performers have to watch out to make sure that their kids grow up with the right kind of values. I think, you know, parents of our generation have to worry about all of our kids uh, because they're potentially must... growing up with a similar sense of uh, kind of public audience. And we have to go to a commercial, but you made a superior point. We'll be back. We call us again at 866-451-1451. We have so much to talk about. It's just marvelous. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. We are back. We're alive. This is Alice Aspen March on Why Our Attention Matters. Talking to Professor Kentaro. Oh, I get, I'm tongue-tied right now. Tell us more, Kentaro, about what you've discovered, please. I mean, one thing I will say is, you know, we've been talking so far about uh, children and the impact of uh, digital technology on children. But, you know, one thing I've learned through teaching and through my own introspection is that as adults, we're really children with a very thinly veiled veneer of civilization on top. And so, so much of what we, you know, what I'm saying about children, I think, is true for us as adults as well. Um, you know, the major challenge, I think, with modern digital technologies is that they draw our attention away from things that we would otherwise believe to be really important, except that we're so busy being distracted by the technology and the content that it offers that we don't pay attention to it. Um, so, you know, I'm particularly uh, excited to be on your show, which is all about attention and the attention factor. Um, I do think it, in, in the end, attention is really time, right? When people talk about my time being very valuable, it's really your attention that you're talking about and how it's limited in this uh, constraint of time. Well, it's very important to get children to realize that their time is valuable. And I don't think a lot of us knew that when we were growing up. I never did, but it's <laughs> it's true. come back to haunt me, you know, as an adult, and it has to do with finances and everything else. So That's true. Plus, can... you know, when you're a child, you kind of imagine that you have infinite time, so you don't worry too much about it. That's true, but we should know that it's valuable and we are and our time is valuable and if we're right. if everybody's you know disconnected because they're all on their cell phones they're never going to learn that no in fact i would say that you know that kind of use of time is actually you're basically literally killing time you're literally just throwing it away instead of spending it on the things that you value you are so correct oh my we are uh, say that again Please. <laughs> uh, what I said was that, um, you know, when you spend your attention, when you attend to things that don't really matter to you, uh, that are just for distraction, you are literally killing time and you're throwing away your valuable time on things that don't matter. 
You know, I stopped watching television because I couldn't stand the commercials. I would watch a really good drama or something, and the commercial would, would come in and say, you need to go to the kitchen and use this canned tomato or something. And I said, that's enough. I don't want to write. I realized then I was wasting my time. So comes along recently, Netflix, and I get hooked. <laughs> it's like all of us. I, I was up until three o'clock, three oh nights in a row watching when when calls the heart or something. <laughs> Excuse me, by Hallmark. It was a fabulous show, but I won't do that again because it killed my mornings. I couldn't wake yes. up. I couldn't function. Absolutely. One thing I will say, so um, a student and I recently did a study where we were trying to understand, you know, the differences between when people are uh, productively immersed at their computers doing homework or doing work and so on, and when they are kind of distractively immersed, when uh, they go down these rabbit holes of things online that they didn't intend to do. Um, and one thing that I will say is that we found that for some people, a certain amount of kind of distractive use of technology was actually beneficial to them in that it was a kind of relaxation. Uh, and so, it, you know, it, whenever they were particularly tired or drained, they would, you know, distract themselves kind of on purpose as a kind of recreational uh, mechanism. And I think that's perfectly okay. Um, I've, like you, I've, you know, found that it's really hard to not watch any TV at all. Um, but I would also say the danger is, you know, that, it, it, that you're watching TV unconsciously and just end up, you know, binge watching hours and hours. Um, and so the trick, like everything else, again, is moderation. And uh, with digital devices, it's just being conscious of how much time you're actually spent spending on things that uh, you don't really care about that much. Um, but also being, you know, willing to uh, allow yourself some time for relaxation, which might very well be through digital means. And if that happens, I don't think any of us have to beat ourselves up about it. I agree, and it's a conscious choice, and that's that's yes. what we want to. That's how we want to function. That's right. I think the consciousness in the choice is really the important thing, and again, that requires attention. And if you do pay attention to that, you get a lot of attention back. Absolutely, and you know, it's so easy, really, to demonstrate this to kids. Uh, all you have to do is make an announcement. I need some time out, so I'm going to choose to watch television for 15 minutes. For example, that yes. For example, that shows a child that you're not only conscious, you're making a choice, you've given yourself permission to make that choice. It is not an exterior kind of thing, but it's an interior thing. And the most, the, the most we can do is teach our kids how to pay attention to their insides, not in a self-centered way, but in a way that they can give to others and recognize that giving to others in any kind of uh, positive way makes them feel better. You know, volunteers get more from volunteering often than they ever realized they would. And I think kids should learn that from the beginning of time. You know, Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. You know, and attention doesn't have to cost anything, Kentaro. Right. And, and we never run out of it. And I no, don't it's think true. It's our most it's valuable, a, I don't know what the right word is, but our most valuable thing that we have and certainly the most valuable thing we can give to others. And uh, at least while we're alive, you're right, we don't run out of it. How about resource or tool? Um, in terms of how to help resource. with respect to attention, you know, one thing that I think these days, I mean, there's lots of apps and, you know, uh, features on phones these days that help you try to limit uh, how you use your phone. And I think if you have a phone, uh, those things are definitely useful. Um, for, you know, for many of us who are over a certain age where we don't absolutely require uh, social media as a way to stay in touch with our friends, um, I think it's helpful to limit 
the ways in which we engage. So, for example, I personally only have you know what you might call a dumb phone. It does voice and uh, some texting, but uh, doesn't really um, engage with the internet. And uh, it's a deliberate choice on my part as a way to help me conserve my attention for things that I really want to spend it on. Uh, I don't believe I'm a strong enough person that if I had a smartphone that I wouldn't be tempted to keep checking it for, you know, random notifications that, again, don't matter that much. But I think just alerting people that they're that how you're how you're policing your own decision, for lack of a better way of putting it, I think right. it has so surprised us that we hadn't we haven't learned how to really manage it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's kind of crept up on us, right? I mean, at some point it was just a mobile phone, and, you know, it's hard to say that mobile phones aren't useful tools uh, that help us get a lot done. And so we bought a mobile phone, and then next thing you know, hey, here's a smartphone, and we can check our email. Well, why not? And then pretty soon, you know, now we have, you know, 25 apps on our phone, and each one's constantly sending us notifications that we think we need or that give us a little bit of pleasure because it seems like somebody's sending us a message, but in reality they're just distracting our attention away from whatever we happen to be doing otherwise. And um, how it's a, it's a, Go ahead. Yeah, it's a challenge, and I think the main thing is, um, as we've been saying, to really try to be conscious of it. Uh, and to find ways to limit it. Um, you know, I've talked to families where the entire family puts away all their digital devices, you know, on some days, like on, the, on one of the weekends, for example, and they don't, you know, if they go out, they don't bother to take their phones with them, things like that. Um, I've occasionally met people who don't even have a mobile phone. Uh, it's surprising to me, especially me in this too. age where we're losing our, you know, we're even losing phone booths, but uh, kudos to them. Um, and, of course, many people have a smartphone, but then, you know, intentionally go on vacations or retreats where they try to minimize their phone use. And I think all of that is very valuable. And how about this obsession with taking pictures? Have we um, that's interesting. I mean, I think there's, again, like everything else, there's positives and negatives to that. I think it's, you know, created a generation that is extremely attuned to kind of visual composition and style, which I see in my students and their kind of visual creativity. And I think that's great. On the other hand, you know, to the extent that it makes us, again, want to seek out an audience, uh, and an audience that doesn't care about us that much, I think it's dangerous and we have to be aware. I am so sorry that our hour has come to an end because it's just fascinating to me how much work you've done and how you're really so far ahead of so many other people. And I'm just delighted you could spare me this hour. And we'll have to do something again, Kentaro. So thank you very, very much. my pleasure. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Attention Matters with your host, Alice Aspen March. Tune in each week as Alice will provide tools, insights, and an innovative perspective on how to consciously give and receive quality attention here on Attention Matters. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.